All right, let's open in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can come before you to learn, to hear from your word, and to um, just learn how we can better partake in the Great Commission. We pray that you would uh, bless this message and that we would um, learn to do evangelism well. Amen. All right, so today we are continuing uh, last week's sermon called The Great Commission, and your role in it. This is part three. Um, going to try to move through this kind of quickly. So re- review, uh, last week we talked about how the Great Commission applies to each of us practically, five ways that it applies to all Christians practically. And we also talked about common hindrances, five common hindrances that we all tend to have with the Great Commission and with evangelism. So today, um, the main thing I'm going to be talking about is just there's 10 tips on like practically doing evangelism well. And that's all I'm going to be talking about today. Number one, understanding the gospel. So, you know, it sounds simple. Like, if you don't understand the gospel, you're going to have a hard time helping someone else understand the gospel. But the, the more you understand the gospel... Um, you know, the more you can help someone else understand it. But specifically, you need to understand the essential elements of the gospel. There's aspects to the gospel. It can be systematically broken down into elements. Um, and people need to get each of those essential elements. There's just some, you know, things in the gospel that if, if a person doesn't understand them, they don't understand the gospel. So something I'm always thinking about when I'm uh, talking to people or in evangelism, there's five things that I want them to understand. Number one, they have to understand God. Like, you know, if you don't, if you don't think the right thing about God, if you don't believe in God, you definitely don't believe the gospel. But namely, God is holy. They need to understand God is holy, God's creator, and God is a judge. They need to understand that about God. And if they don't know that about God, then they need to know that about God. Because if they don't know that, they're not going to get the gospel. Second, they need to understand some things about humanity, about man. Um, Man is made in God's image and made to be righteous. They need to understand that. They need to understand sin, the fall and the sin nature. They need to know that they have a problem. They need to understand the guilt and weight of their personal sins and see sin as a whole, its entirety. It's a problem we all deal with. Um, They need to understand Christ, that Christ is God, and he was perfect, and he died for us. You know, if you don't get that, you won't get the gospel. Um, And they need to understand what receiving salvation is, that it's by repentance and faith and that it's a package. You can't just get half of it. So God saves you from your guilt, and God saves you from your sin, as in your lifestyle of sin. And you can't have half of salvation. You get the whole thing. And they need to understand that it's, it's one package, you get the whole thing. You can't not be saved from your lifestyle of sin, even though you don't want to be saved from your lifestyle of sin, and just have, be saved from your guilt. Um, so when I'm talking to people, I'm always thinking about, do they understand the core elements? Or um, yeah, That's what I try to talk about. When I'm talking to someone and trying to um, share the gospel with them, you know, I think of it in terms of helping them understand God, helping them understand sin, helping them understand Christ, helping them understand receiving salvation. You need to know the bad news before you can even care about the good news. Like, why would you care? So that's very helpful for me because sometimes when you're talking to someone in evangelism, it's easy to like, oh, what do I talk about? What do I say? Well, five things. God, man, sin, Christ, receiving salvation. All right, second thing, um, don't sugarcoat the gospel. 
this can be tempting to do. Like, the gospel is a hard thing for people to accept. But, um, and it can be easy to want to sugar. Oh, okay. All right. That's better. All right, can we take a look at, can we get on the slides, Luke 14, 28 through 33? All right, back to what I was saying. Don't sugarcoat the gospel. So this is uh, what Jesus was saying about it. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. And the same way, those of you, um, those of you who do not give up everything cannot be my disciples. Christ doesn't want people to misunderstand the gospel and then accept it because, um, you know, it's just the best thing ever. It'll make my life happy forever. I'll never have any problems. Christ wants people to count the cost and to know that it's worth it. We can't sugarcoat the gospel. Thirdly, um, practice. Practice makes a difference. So there's four things that practice does that will help you to do better evangelism. Practice helps you understand what works well and what doesn't. It helps you to be less nervous. It helps you to become more familiar with the scriptures or to see if you're not familiar enough with the scriptures. And it helps you to better articulate the gospel. It really helps with the being less nervous. Like you just got to force yourself to do it. If you want uh, more exposure, you can talk to Daniel, Stephen, or myself, especially Stephen, and we can go to Wright State and evangelize together. All right, number four, do everything with prayer. So prayer is how we access God's divine power. Nothing should be done without prayer. And the main reason you should always do everything with prayer and pray before you talk to someone about the gospel, like God's the only one who can change people's hearts. You can't do it. So if you're talking to someone about the gospel without prayer, that's stupid. It's really stupid. Everything should be done with prayer. No one comes unless the Father draws him. All right, point number five. Understand the importance of relating well with people. So how you relate with the people you're evangelizing to, um, it makes a difference in how they end up thinking about the gospel. How you interact with them affects how they see God and how they see the gospel. And there are certain ways the Bible tells us to interact with people. Number one, we should be humble and respectful. Let's look at 1 Peter 3.15. Can we get 1 Peter 3.15? All right. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So we should be humble and respectful. 
we also should be tactful and wise. Let's look at Proverbs 16, 23. The hearts of the wise make their mouths prudent, and their lips promote instruction. That was not uh, the translation I thought it was, or maybe I got the wrong verse. But um, the heart of... Yeah. The heart of the wise makes his speech judicious and adds persuasiveness to his lips. Like, tactfulness is something we all need to have. It's something you grow in. And if you're not tact, you probably don't realize that you're not. So, maybe ask someone about that, your spouse or your roommates. Anyone who I know who isn't tactful, and back when I wasn't very tactful, doesn't know that they are. <laughs> so ask someone, your discipler, who will tell you honestly whether or not you are. Our speech should be gracious. Let's take a look at Colossians 4, 5, and 6. 4 verses 5 and 6. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. We also see the tactfulness. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Another thing, um, if you're friendly with people, it's easier to get them to talk about things they don't necessarily want to talk about. And if you're like evangelizing on the street to people you don't know, most of them don't want to talk about the gospel. But if you're friendly, people are more inclined to talk about things they wouldn't otherwise talk about. The ability to befriend strangers is something you're required to pursue as a Christian because it's... It's so helpful for evangelism and it's necessary for Christian community. We can only have Christian community if we're getting to know each other. If we're not becoming friends with the people in our church, then we're not part of Christian community. All right, number six learn to be all things to all people. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 19 through 23. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, um, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. So sometimes the way we relate to people or the things we talk about or how we act um, is a hindrance to us reaching out to some people. And we have to be willing to change how we act or how we talk or what we talk about and set that aside for the greater good of the gospel. Like Paul starts this out by saying, though I am free to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone. And then he explains what he means by that. He gives up all his rights for the sake of the gospel. We shouldn't let our strange preferences get in the way of our sharing the gospel. <laughs> All right, number seven, uh, bring people into your life. So uh, one thing that will help you with reaching out to people is if um, just by the way you live your life, you bring other people into it. Like Jesus with the disciples, he lived his life with them. 
And that, that helps for discipleship and it helps for evangelism and it also makes it so you can much easier you know, reach out to people if you just bring them into your everyday life. If you're planning like what you're doing for fun on the weekend, you're going to the beach, invite people. Invite people you don't know and invite people you do know. Or invite people you'd like to reach out to and invite friends because that makes it easier. And it works better for building community. All right, point number eight, hearing from the Spirit. So I've mentioned this before, but um, one of the most necessary things to, to excel in evangelism is hearing from the voice of the Spirit. Because the Spirit will give you wisdom in particular conversations and when working with people. Let's look at James 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask of God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will, and it will be given to you. So when we're evangelizing, we want to hear from the Spirit, and we should be praying that God would speak to us, and that God would give us words of wisdom. Point number nine, look for what God is doing and follow what God is doing. So the biggest key to being effective towards evangelism is look for God working in people's hearts. Because God is the one who draws people, not us. So if you see the the activity of the Holy Spirit in a person's heart, you should really pursue that deeper. That's a good sign. Uh, Let's look at Acts 18, 9 and 10. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So I think um, what he meant by I have many people in this city, he had many people who weren't saved but who he was going to save. God plans on saving people, and we need to be, inter- we're, our job is just delivering. We're like the midwives, we just do the delivery, but God births the child and creates. If you look for what God is doing, that's the most effective thing you can do. Because if God's doing something, then something's going to happen. If God's not doing something, nothing's going to happen. Look for the activity of God in people's lives and in people's hearts. All right, last point, number 10. Remember the importance of discipleship. Don't just drop people off. So like, you know, if you're evangelizing and God does bring the person to himself and they, um, don't just leave them and forget about them. Like, the Great Commission says to make disciples. If we're only interested in seeing people come to Christ, but we're not interested in seeing them grow in the church, that's an incomplete gospel. You need to continue things with discipleship. We're called to make disciples, not just to make converts. And people are saved into God's church. You're saved into community. People need to be shown community. They need to be shown the ropes. They need to be, um, they need someone to teach them. But as I said, this is a collaboration. So Stephen was going, Stephen is going to speak, but Jessica is actually going to speak about YWAM and evangelism.